Good morning. Welcome today, uh, June 14th. And uh, welcome to the Lord's house. And we thank we thank the Lord for gathering us together this morning. Of every breath I could ever breathe, we we'll live for you. Just 
Good morning, church. It is always good to be in the house of the Lord. And um, Sunday is always a, a time that I look forward to, especially at uh, this time that we have our shelter in place. I do miss uh, the fellowship of God's people. Even though we are spiritually together uh, through our live stream, it is different uh, because we were wired by the Lord to be together. Uh, not forsaking, you know, our fellowship or our coming together uh, as a congregation. So it is always a, an exciting time to worship the Lord with God's people. And we have a few of our members who are gathered here and we practice, you know, the social distancing. And uh, we believe that the Lord uh, is always uh, delighted, you know, when we come to, together uh, to worship Him in the true sense of... Uh, spirit, uh, where we are united together in spirit, uh, in the Lord, uh, and the Holy Spirit is the one that binds us together, and we worship Him in truth, because we have the spirit of truth in us, and we also have the word of truth, and so today, um, we would like to commit this time uh, to the Lord, and ask that He would bless our time together, and um, just want to thank the Lord for taking good care of us uh, this uh, past week in uh, providing the protection that we need, the safety in making sure that our, you know, our needs are uh, supplied, and He faithfully does, and uh, for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives that we can only do good things uh, because of the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and thus uh, things that we do for the Lord are acceptable to Him only because uh, the work of His grace in our lives. So this morning, uh, let's look to God in prayer and commit this time and that the Lord would uh, bless our time together. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise You and thank You for this time that we can come together as Your people. And we pray, Lord, that You would uh, go before us uh, and lead us into Your presence and that You would 
use the, the transforming power of your word to minister to us, to encourage us, to comfort us, to uh, be given opportunity uh, throughout this week uh, to apply your principles so that it will have um, a transforming uh, power in the way we live so that it will be pleasing and acceptable to you. We ask that you would bless your word for this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so at this time, um, last uh, Sunday, um, I didn't conclude my uh, message uh, because, uh, uh, because of a tribute that uh, I gave. Um, I was led by the Lord to speak on a life well lived. And Pastor Bert uh, passed away, uh, graduated uh, from this world to the eternal uh, home uh, where our father lives forever. Uh, last May 30, and so I was um, uh, led by the Lord uh, to give a tribute to this man of God. And so we will continue and conclude our message on the uh, God's purpose or plan uh, during this global pandemic. But let me just review what I said uh, last um, Sunday. And we talked about the faithfulness uh, of uh, Pastor Bert's life as commended and rewarded uh, by the Lord. It is based on 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. And that uh, message last Sunday, as I said, is a tribute to a life well lived, just like the Apostle Paul at the end of his life when he was incarcerated in Rome, uh, uh, charged um, insurrection against uh, the government uh, of Rome. And so in the last remaining uh, days, weeks of his life, uh, he wrote this letter as a charge to uh, Timothy, his uh, uh, disciple, the one that he's been mentoring as a young pastor. And he passed the baton to Timothy, you know, to continue to be faithful in the proclamation of the gospel and building up the saints, uh, the church that was entrusted to him. And so this is Paul's letter, and I liken it uh, uh, to Pastor Bert's life. And so Pastor Bert's life is worth emulating, worth praising and thanking God for because his life of faith in his Savior and Lord uh, is exemplary and it is a life obe of obedient faith to Jesus, his Lord. And so therefore, that is a life that has his full reward realized in the presence of God. And we talked about uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses two, 6 to 8. And in verse 6, you know, it says, you know, the release from this life or the departure from this life, uh, his death. It says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Uh, like Paul, Pastor Bert's life is a dedicated life to God, even at the point of death. Secondly, it is also a life departed from this world, meaning, you know, his life uh, uh, released from the cares of this world, uh, just like the Apostle Paul, even to the end of his life. Uh, Pastor Bird is still thinking about, you know, what he can do for the Lord. And then it is a life designed for heaven. Uh, Revelations chapter 14, verse 3, 13. All of those who have lived in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will be ushered in heaven and their labors or their services for the Lord will follow them. So that life is not meant here for earth, but a life designed to be with the Father in heaven. Not only did we talked about the release of that, of that particular life, but also the record of one's life. In verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 4 says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. So in summary, what Paul is trying to say, it is the summation of his life's record and testimony. It is a meaningful and fulfilling life that is lived for Christ. And that is the kind of life that Pastor Bert lived practice, uh, not only taught, but practice during his time here on earth. And so, you know, his life, just like Paul, is a devoted, you know, uh, soldier. He said, I have fought a good fight. Pastor Bert, you know, echoed that same, you know, victorious declaration that Paul mentioned in verse uh, 7. And secondly, not only his life is a devoted soldier, but also a life discipline a disciplined athlete, and I would liken Pastor Bert to Ezra in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10 to verse 10, chapter 7, verse 10, where Ezra, you know, not only studied the Word of God, practiced it, and taught it. 
He is a diligent student of the Word of God. He is an effective uh, uh, teacher of the Word of God. And his life is lived not only for Christ, but also, um, I would say, uh, founded and grounded in biblical principles. So he is a you know, disciplined student of the Word of God. And thirdly, he is a determined steward, a faithful manager of what the Lord has entrusted to him. Like Paul, Pastor Bert, the Lord has entrusted this precious faith to him. And he had kept the faith, and that's what Paul said, and Pastor Bert kept the faith. Now, from the time that he received the Lord Jesus Christ at a young age as his Savior and Lord, and through the time when the Lord called him, he had kept the faith. He had kept it. He had proven himself faithful to the Lord. He had kept the terms of his contract between Christ and him, just like, you know, Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he managed and looked after that faith that which the Lord entrusted in him, both in the good times and bad times of, of his life. He never forsook his faith. And then lastly, it is not only the release of that life, the record of that life, but also the reward of a faithful life. That in verse 8, it says, there is, a, a, there is laid a crown up for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not for me only, but unto them also that love his appearing. And that is the glorious heavenly reward, a crown of righteousness. Because God is righteous and perfect, only perfection can live in the presence of God. And as we know, when a person receives the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, the righteousness of Christ has been imputed or his righteousness covered that person, covered and washed from his sins. And so therefore made acceptable, you know, and pleasing to God and loved by God. And so only those who have the righteousness of Christ can live in the presence of God. And just like Paul, Pastor Bert has received that perfection, uh, that righteousness. And therefore, you know, in the Bema Seat of Christ um, in heaven, one day God will, uh, Pastor Bert will give an account of his life, of all the things that he had said, all the things, his thoughts, his motives, and the things that he had done for the Lord uh, that are good will be rewarded, and the bad ones will be consumed by the holy fire of God. And so therefore, it is a, a crown of righteousness will be given by the Lord. That's what verse 8 says. You know, uh, the righteous judge uh, knows every heart of every man. He sees every act. He hears every word. He knows it all. He knows every, you know, detail of Pastor Bert's life. And not only the crown of righteousness will be given by the Lord, secondly, the crown of righteousness will be given to those who love or to love to uh, uh, the Lord's appearing. And so therefore, um, it is a result Pastor Bird has been preparing his life with the aid of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of his word. has been preparing his life for that day that he would see the Lord uh, in heaven. And so as a result, of that committed, faithful, diligent, uh, disciplined life, uh, his sincere and total commitment to Christ is rewarded. Um, in a way, I would say that it is not what we profess about Christ that truly matters. It, what, it is what we do for Christ that really arrests the attention and the heart of God. Pastor Bert not only professed you know, his confession of faith, not only he committed to that uh, entrustment of faith, he taught it, studied it, practiced it, and lived it. And so therefore, it matters to Christ. So in conclusion, I said that Sunday that the Lord Jesus Christ know all about Pastor Bert's life. He had been a dedicated soldier for Christ. He had been a disciplined student for Christ. And he has been a determined steward for Christ. So that was the message last Sunday. And so today, what I would like to do is, um, you know, continue uh, the message that we started three Sundays ago, that God has a plan, that God has a purpose why he had allowed, you know, this global pandemic, you know, to, to happen uh, that started in China and then spread across the world. He has a plan. And so quickly, I use Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 10, and Psalm 135, verses 5 to 6 to show us that the Lord, you know, has this uh, purpose and he has this plan why 
this coronavirus happened. And we believe that this virus has reshaped and shaken the world uh, uh, at this time, and it is not by accident. You know, I also mentioned that it is a prophetic word of Christ. It is a work of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as he allowed Satan, you know, to test uh, Job. It is a work of God, and it's a great opportunity for every believer in the Lord, or for every believer in the Lord, for Christians, you know, to be able to share the gospel. And not only that, for us believers to advance, you know, his work of building his kingdom. He said, you know, uh, in, in the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. He called us, you know, unto salvation, and he used us to serve him and to share the gospel so that there would be those who would be included in his kingdom. And so, therefore, he would like uh, to use this, you know, situation, this uh, pandemic, for us to advance his work of building his kingdom and effectively share and communicate the power of his transforming word to bring about a great revival in our hearts, in our life, a great revival in our church, for churches, in our communities, and in the world. And so therefore, as I said, Psalm 135, verses 5 to 6, the Lord is pleased in whatever he does, in his plans and purposes, because it will happen, or they will happen, not only to uh, the benefits of uh, the believers, but also to the glory and praise of the Lord. So with that said, nothing happens in our lives and in this world except His purpose, and He will accomplish the full extent of His plans. For His eternal enjoyment, the Lord does what He pleases, right? And He shared that to His children, an ever-increasing enjoyment of those who love Him. And Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10, you know, says, Remember the former things of old. He said, For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. It talks about the uniqueness of God, that He is God alone, and there's no other God, you know, in the world but Him. And, and verse 10, it says that, Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. In other words, whatever God set in motion, even before the beginning of the world, whatever His plans and purposes, it will be accomplished. It will happen because He is the Lord. And so God has the rightful authority, the freedom, the wisdom, and the power to bring about everything that He intends to happen, even before they happen, which means God plans and govern all things. Quote by John Piper. And there are times in the course of human history when the Lords want to shake, you know, and the, get the world's attention. For what? In order to show that how fragile life is, how short and brief life is, and that we have no promise of tomorrow. And so, therefore, I believe this is one of those times. In the course of history, there were so many events, wars, pandemics, you know, plagues, um, uh, calamities that happened. When God says in the book of Matthew, when the sign of his times, uh, 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 that he's coming, there will be an increasing event of calamities, an increasing events of plagues, and there will be rumors of wars, and immorality and sin will increase, knowledge will increase, and those are the signs of the times. And in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 26 to 27, we are told that his voice will shake the earth, and that what he has promised will come. Not only it will come, it will remove the things that are shaken, and only those things that, you know, that are important and significant in His eternal plan, that it will impact eternity, will remain. So what God is saying is that He will shake almost every part of the world so that He alone will be revealed, His purposes and His plans. And with that, Christians will get exposed with the kind of life that they are building. Are they building you know, their foundation of life in the sand? that can easily be washed, that can easily be shaken, or they're building their lives in the foundation of Christ, the rock, the solid foundation. And that is said in Matthew chapter 7, 24 to 27. Um, and not only that, we said that there are at least, you know, there are several, but there are at least three important things that God is saying that He needs to happen during this global pandemic. And it pertains to, especially to believers 
uh, of, in the Lord Jesus Christ to us as Christians. Number one, you know, this global pandemic has a purpose because this is part of God's plan. He allowed it because we live in a sin-cursed world where our fallen uh, human beings, you know, are sinful. And so, therefore, God is, t you know, getting our attention for us to remove idols in our lives. You will find that in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3. And then secondly, He wants us to, you know, look deep within and see you know, the people and things that we enthrone in our lives and recognize that they are idols that compete, you know, in terms of our allegiance, in terms of our priority, in terms of our, you know, passion and love. And so, therefore, God wants us to recognize those idols and repent, ask for forgiveness. And then the third thing that I believe that God wants us to understand during this unprecedented time is for us to return to prayer. For us to respect, you know, God's house of prayer and worship. And with that said, I talked about the removal of idols in our lives. All of our idols must come down. And that's what Ezekiel chapter 14 verse 3 says. Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity. So our iniquity became a stumbling block before, you know, you know before God. And should I be inquired by all of them? That's what the Lord says. So an idol is anything that goes, you know, gets between us and God. Idols can be, you know, our money, our possessions, our resources. Idols can be people that we love, people that we place on top of God. You know, it could be our career, our pursuit of our ambition. It could be uh, the things that we own and hoard it could be fame position it could be our education it could be anything our church can be our idols our programs our pastor can be our idols our spouses our children so anything in this world that we put first before god is considered an idol in other words what god is trying to say to you know each and every child of him is that we have to put completely our trust and our faith in Him alone. And faith in any man, in faith in any material thing, in any ideology, in any ambition, in any passion other than God, and those things that we exalt and lift up is an abomination to God, is considered idolatry. So be very, very careful, you know, in the things that we place in our hearts, in the things that we pursue with our minds, in the things that we love passionately in this life. As Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 to 5 says, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Not only during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, and even now, you know, uh, the signs of His coming are, are evidence that the time is at hand. For many shall come, he said, in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You know, notice the word, my name. There are many who are claiming, you know, the anointing of the Lord Jesus Christ, who are claiming they have the reputation as a prophet of God or as the Messiah. There are many who are using the authority of his name. In fact, you know, there are several um, religions that started in the Philippines who claim that they are, you know, the messenger of God, the prophet of God, the angel of God, or they are the, you know, the son of God. And across the world, there are those who name the name of Christ, but they are called what? Deceiver. And the word deceive in, in that particular passage that we read is those who practice deception, you know, with their personalities, with their egos, claiming to have the anointing of God. And so the cults, the founders of their own religion claim that they are the way to God, that they are the means, you know, to, uh, to get the approval of God, or they are, you know, the anointed one of God. There's only one, Christ Jesus, the mediator. Christ Jesus, you know, the one who inter intercedes for us. Christ Jesus, who died on the cross as our Savior. And so in Matthew chapter 7, 21 to 23, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father was in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Or, you know, proclaim, you know, taught in your name. And in your name drive out demons. 
and in your name perform miracles, healing, you know, uh, miracles, then I will turn, tell them plainly, I never knew you, away from me, you evildoers. You know, evildoers, they are deceivers. Evildoers are workers of iniquity. They are, you know, a worker of lawlessness. They use their lawlessness as a standard of law. You know, that's why uh, the leaders of the cult and those who uh, embrace human philosophies and ideology use the standard of human standard, the human principle. You know, they use even the standard of Satan and the demons to uh, cast and promote, you know, their lawlessness. And we as Christians should be wary and should be careful uh, who we listen to. Not because they are, you know, profess that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and proclaim the Lord, you know, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they are truly legitimate servants of God. There are those who use their fame, their authority, there are those who use their resources to advance, you know, their own agenda. And they never really proclaim, you know, the cross of Christ about how important it is to preach about sin and the cross. And they don't expound and really explain, you know, uh, the, word of, the word of God. It is more of their self, you know, in, uh, interest narrative, uh, their successes and victories rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we were talking about idols, the question now is, what idols do we need to remove in our lives so that God can start revival in our hearts? So that what kind of idols we need to remove, you know, in the ministry and programs of the church so that the Spirit of Christ will be the one to direct what kind of program and ministry that we pursue. And so therefore, you know, he cannot start the work of revival, you know, in our lives, in our church, in our community, and in this nation and across the globe. It, unless we repent. And so that leads me to the second point. When was the last time that the Lord, through the Holy Spirit and through His Word, convicted us of our sins, of convicted us of the idols that we need to remove? When was the last time He and I, you know, uh, fall down before the Lord on our knees, you know, crying and asking for repentance to forgive us? And so the second point of our message is, you know, uh, is the repentance Repentance is the key for us to receive the refreshing of our soul. In Acts chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, it says, Peter said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. See, times of refreshing, right? Times of God's guidance, of God's direction, of God's leading, times of God's blessing, times of God's favor will only come after we repent. And it says, And you shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And only then that we will be effective proclaimer of the gospel. It's only then that we will, you know, be effective in helping fulfill the Great Commission and building His kingdom. So what God, as I said in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, that God is shaking, uh, chapter 12, that God is shaking everything, you know, in this world even shaking our lives, as mentioned in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26. But nothing can shake the lives of those who are righteous, who are upright in God. In other words, those believers in Christ, His children, who are walking in faith and living by faith. In fact, you know, many passages in Scripture talks about, you know, the righteous those who truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only you know, profess that they believe, confess that they believe, but also practice what they believe, you know, cannot be shaken you know, with all uh, the concerns, with all the panic, with all the, um, uh, the things of the world that will remove and take their hearts away from the Lord. Psalm 55 verse 22 says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord. You know, Cast means to throw you know, just like fishing, when you throw your line, it says, throw it as hard as you can, all of your burdens to the Lord. And he said, he will sustain you. He will strengthen you. 
He will supply everything that you need so that you would stand, you know, unshaken. And he promised he shall not su never suffer or will not allow the righteous to be moved, the righteous to be shaken. You know, during the beginning of the global pandemic, there are those people who are in a panic. You know, they hoard toilet papers, you know, uh, paper towels, sanitizer, alcohol, you name it, uh, even canned goods and all of that. There are those of us, you know, because the Bible says, you know, there's never a word panic in the Word of God. There's never a word panic in those who rely in the Word of God. There was never a word panic in those who live their faith and trust in God. And so many of us experienced that. You know, we were not part of those who panic and hoard. We just simply trust God. You know, and we also completely entrusted our lives to God in the midst of this deadly disease, this unseen virus. And thus far, by the grace of God, He protected each one of us. You know, He covered us with His wings of protection and love and never allowed this pandemic to touch our lives. And so therefore, in Psalm 16, verse 8, again, we are told that the righteous shall not be moved. Uh, the psalmist says, I have set the Lord always before me. In other words, you know, we should fix our eyes on Jesus alone, right? We should fix, focus our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, alone, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And he said, because he is at my right hand. It talks about God's complete protection. It talks about God's, you know, total provision. It talks about God's empowerment in our lives. And I shall not be moved. In other words, I shall not be shaken because we are grounded and founded on the solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Psalm 100, you know, verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 7 says this, For the righteous, for the, Lord loves, for the Lord loves righteousness. His countenance does behold the upright. You know, God's you know, eyes, God's face, God's favor is upon the righteous. We are righteous uh, through faith, by grace. We, God is perfecting our righteousness until we make it to heaven by sanctifying us through the Holy Spirit and the truth of His Word. In other words, when we study God's Word and we apply God's Word, the principle of God's Word, what He does through the Holy Spirit, He is changing our lifestyle, our behavior and perspective of life into the perspective of God into the behavior and attitude or characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And thus, He's transforming us to be conformed to the likeness and image of the Lord Jesus. We become Christ-like. So my challenge for those of you who are here in this church, including myself, and those of you who are listening to this message, this pandemic should have driven us more into the Word of God. So pick up your Bibles and get serious with God. Be on your knees you know, in prayer, trembling in reverence before our holy God. We need to really repent and start looking for the time of refreshing to come. Perhaps, you know, the reason why we have not experienced the fullness of God's blessing, why we have not experienced, you know, a prosperous life, a successful life, as mentioned in Joshua chapter 1 verse 8, is because we have not turned our eyes, our hearts, our mind, our spirit, you know, in the transforming power of the Word of God. We have never taken the time during this pandemic, you know, to take that opportunity of being stayed in place, to grow in the Word of God, to be intimate in our communion with God. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 to 3, reminds me of uh, what the Lord uh, told Solomon uh, and his people during that time. Uh, and he was asking them in the midst of their celebration to repent. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 1 to 3 says, Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire, you know, they offer sacrifice to God when they finished building the temple for God. The fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house, the tabernacle that Solomon built. All right. And he hired people. And it's a magnificent, magnificent temple. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord has filled the Lord's house. And then look at 
uh, the next verse, verse 3. And when all the children of Israel, and the nation of Israel, saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord filled you know, that house, what, you know what they did? They bowed down with their faces to the ground upon the pavement. It means they worship and praise the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. In other words, they had this wonderful celebration. They had this, you know, um, uh, feast that they're saying that the favor of the Lord rests upon them. Not only they were saying, you know, the glory of the Lord, you know, is upon us. We are a chosen people of God. And they were excited. They were rejoicing. But in the midst of that celebration, and on that particular day that God mentioned this to Solomon, look at verse 13. It is a warning. He said, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. In other words, what God is trying to tell Solomon, Solomon, you know, I accept your offering. I will dwell in this tabernacle. But if your heart and the heart of the people turn away from me, turn your backs away from me, and decided to follow other gods, right? And, for, you know, and forget me. This is what he said. This is the warning. This is the thing, you know, that God would use to discipline them. And it's also the next verse is the, is the verse that we usually quote, all right? This is what God said. Not only is it a warning, but also it is a rem- remembrance. It is to challenge God's people you know, to always have this in their minds and in their hearts. He said, if my people, because they are God's favored nation, which are called by my name, God called them, right, out of the nations of all the world. And there's nothing lovely about them. He said, if they shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear their land. And so God is telling them, you know, they, if ever they find themselves forgetting the Lord and getting deeper into sin and serving other gods, the Lord will use circumstances and situation, and in their case, use you know, other nations to invade them, to teach them, to discipline them, so that they will turn their hearts back to the Lord. It reminds me also of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was chosen by God, you know, as a teenager to proclaim, you know, the judgment of God, the warning of God to the stiff-necked people of Judah. And for 40 years, you know, uh, Jeremiah was commanded by the Lord, instructed by the Lord to tell them of the coming judgment. The northern kingdom was already invaded by the Assyrian and the Babylonians are going to come down and punish them as a nation because of their sin and disobedience to the Lord. And so this is what God said to Jeremiah. Verse 16, 17, and 19. And he said, I will utter my judgments against them, speaking to the people of Judah. Again, the northern kingdom, Israel, has already been destroyed, conquered. And he said, against them, touching all their wickedness, who have forsaken me, and have burned incense unto other gods. In other words, they replace Yahweh as their God and worship the works of their own hands. They worship, you know, other gods of other nations. Thou therefore get up thy loins, and arise, and speak unto them all that I command thee. And this is what he said, Be not dismayed at their face. In other words, be not dis- be discouraged. Even though they will you know, not listen to you, even though they will scoff at you, lest I confound thee before them. Look at verse 19. And they shall fight against you. In other words, you know what? They will not listen to what God is saying to Jeremiah. They will not even heed the word of God. But they shall not prevail against thee. God is saying, Jeremiah, don't be discouraged. They will not overcome you, and they should not discourage you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. And then jumping to chapter 5 of the book of Jeremiah, look at verse 3 and verse 23. This is what God said. This is what he told Jeremiah to tell this people, this rebellious people of Judah. He said, O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? And the answer is, yes, God is always upon those who live the truth. Thou hast stricken them. You know, thou hast, you know, uh, punished them. But they have not grieved. They were not remorseful. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. In other words, he sent them, you know, uh, 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 events, 
situations in their lives. You know, they were um, uh, disciplined by God, but they refused God's correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. Oh, gosh. There are those, you know, who experience, you know, backsliding in the Lord. You know, their hearts are hardened like Pharaoh uh, of Egypt during the time of Moses. And it says they refuse to return. In other translation, it says they refuse to repent. They refuse to acknowledge their sins. They refuse to ask God for forgiveness. So, verse 23, But these people had a revolting and rebellious heart. They revolted and went their way or gone. That's the kind of nation, you know, Jeremiah was dealing with. They refused to repent. And it also reminds me of Luke chapter 21, verses 5 to 7. And as, and as some spake of the temple, how it was adorned with goodly, you know, goodly stones and gifts. This is after the Lord Jesus Christ brought them to you know, uh, the mountain, overlooking uh, Jerusalem and the grandeur of uh, the temple. And he told the Lord Jesus Christ, look at that temple, how majestic and grand and those precious you know, stones you know, that were put together to, to see this grand edifice. And so this is what the Lord is saying to his disciple. And as some spake of the temple, I was adorned with goodly stones and gifts. He said, as for these things which you behold, as for that temple and the things around it that you see, the days will come in which there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, God, Jesus Christ is saying, this temple will be destroyed. And they ask him, say, Master, but when shall these things be? And what shine will there be when the things shall come to pass? And you know what? In 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Roman Empire. And look at uh, verse 25 and 26 of, um, uh, of chapter 1 of Luke. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken shaken look at verse 27 and then shall they see the son of man right this is the things that are going to happen right before he comes and they shall see the son of man coming in a cloud with power and great glory and when these things begin to come to pass then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh he's talking about you know the coming of the lord you know, from heaven to the clouds, and he would rapture those who have died, you know, in Christ, and those that will be resurrected first, and they will meet him in the air with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And then, you know, uh, we will precede those who have gone before, and those who are alive during that time will also be what? Translated or, tran you know, uh, will will meet the Lord Jesus Christ up in the air without experience physical death. And so people uh, are, who have been with Jesus Christ, people who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus, people who have lived their faith, are geared and programmed to withstand the storms coming their way. In other words, God will protect. God will provide the sustaining grace and strength. God will provide you know, the provision uh, uh, that his children need when storms of life, when calamities, when struggles, crises will come into their lives that they will not be shaken. People who have cast down, you know, their idols, people, Christians who have removed, you know, and repented of their sins are ready for a great work of God in a redemption plan and deliverance of, you know, uh, the lost soul and the deliverance of the saints a work that will shake the world in repentance and thus it would lead to the time of refreshing, you know, time of revival. And this brings us to the conclusion, point number three. God is using this situation. You know, I'm glad that um, uh, Governor Newsom, the governor of the state of California, and also the mayor of San Francisco, and also the mayor of uh, Alameda County where we live, uh, had um, loosened the restriction of, you know, uh, coming together. They have allowed this week, you know, for churches to open and to gather. But we still are limited 
in the capacity of the building to accommodate the number of people. Um, you know, I'm saddened uh, by that because uh, later I'm going to mention the reason for that. But uh, God is arresting and trying to get our attention to bring about, you know, the significance and importance of prayer in the life of the church and how we should, you know, value, you know, worship in its true sense of its, the word. And so in Luke chapter 19, 45 to 46, this is what God said. And he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein. In other words, you know, that desecrate the temple. And them that bought, saying unto them, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it in a den of robbers or thieves. You know, as God's people, we need, you know, we need to cry out in prayer to God for revival to happen in our lives through brokenness and repentance. So God's house today, His house of worship, is, I believe, uh, there's those, uh, I don't know exactly, you know, uh, the numbers uh, here in our place, uh, in our state, across the country, and across the globe. But I believe there are those house of prayer today that are not really, in the true sense of the word, a house of prayer. Why are we, you know, sort of lying and denying about this truth? Well, the concern I have is that if Jesus Christ came into this church, in every church in America, in every church, you know, in the world, he would probably turn the tables like he did in the temple during his time. Because he will find that his house is no longer a house of prayer. That he will find that his house is no longer a house of worship. There's no real prayer going on there. At best, you know, perhaps there is a quick prayer, more of programs and, um, you know, quick uh, type of, of worship, but void of the Holy Spirit. So, at the end, People would pray, probably five, ten minutes. God's people, as I said, we need to cry out before God. You know, and that's, I believe, part of the reason why God allowed this pandemic. For us collectively as a church, together, look within our hearts, evaluate our lives. What are our priorities? What are our passions and pursuit in life? And then collectively as we gather, we are the church, not this building. Evaluate the types of programs that we have, the kind of ministry we maintain and the kind of ministry we would pursue and see if God is really in it and see if the Spirit is really involved in them. God does not need more prayers and more sermons if those who bring the sermons and those who lead the prayer are not truly connected to the Word, are not truly engaged in communion with God. You know, there are pastors who would only prepare their messages, you know, during the time uh, a day or two before they speak, or Bible study leaders who would cram it in one day, or those who would only pray, you know, during public prayer never enjoyed the intimate communion with the Lord. So many times, you know, His Word in the pulpit is shut up by the Holy Spirit because it is not an empowered, you know, message. It is not an empowered life because the Holy Spirit is not the one in control sitting on the throne of that person's life. It is not the Word of God that permeates the mind and the heart and the spirit of the one who bring the word of God. Our slick programs will not work. We have programmed everything to accommodate everyone. I was talking to one of the deacons of our church and I mentioned it, you know, about some churches who are considered, you know, progressive church. And I thought what he mentioned, PC, I thought he was talking about the computer, a personal computer. And there are those churches, you know, who try to 
accommodate. Uh, we called him the seeker-friendly church. All right? They would preach watered-down gospel. They would replace the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with any other so-called gospel so that they can bring large people into their, you know, uh, their church or churches, but never really having you know, fed God's people with the true manna of the word. And so if the Holy Spirit shows up with His power in our churches, the question is, can He get in? Is He welcome? Is His presence and power seen in the life of those who bring the Word of God? Is His presence and power the one leading and controlling the lives of His people? Will His presence and power be recognized inside the church? I believe, for the most part, it will be not. Because it's never been part of our program. Since it's never been part of our program, that leads us to the beginning, to where it starts. Perhaps it's never been part of our lives. Who is sitting on the throne of our hearts? Who is dictating the direction of our lives? Whose journey of faith are we following? How is it possible today that there are so-called brothers and sisters in the Lord, believers, you know, who watch rated movies and they don't feel convicted and feel comfortable watching it? And they will come to church having that same kind of mentality and manner. They will sit in the church. They will feel comfortable and entertained but never convicted by the power of his word. Reminds me, uh, uh, Exodus, uh, when Moses went up to the, mount, the mountain, Mount Sinai, and he was, you know, with God for a number of days waiting for the tablets to be given, the instruction, the Ten Commandments. And the people were waiting, and they grew anxious and impatient. And so they decided, you know, to uh, gather all the golds, the jewelries, the things that they brought from Egypt and melt all of them. And they, you know, um, uh, form a golden calf and worship that golden calf. And so when Mo Moses descended and his face glowing because he was in the presence of God, he was totally flabbergasted by what he saw. He was disappointed and God was so mad that he would like to wipe those people out, kill them. But Moses interceded on their behalf. He said, these are your people. In other words, he's asking them, grant them mercy. And so that generation never entered the promised land, only the second generation. And it reminded me of the Spirit of God saying, you know, to each and every Christian, to our churches, your golden calves are coming down. Your slick programs, your ministries that are not spirit-led, that are not born out of the prayer life of the leaders and the members, those ministries and programs that we pursue that are not spirit-birthed, that is not spirit-inspired, bring them down. They're abomination to the Lord. And in the book of Isaiah, you know, God says, I'm tired of your sacrifices. I'm tired of your feasts. I'm tired of your offerings. And he said, repent. Come and let us reason together and repent. God is more concerned about the heart of his people because we are the temple of God. And when we come together, we are His temple. We are the church. And God would like to dwell, the Spirit would like to dwell with hearts and lives that are cleansed by the Word of God. Lives that are pleasing to Him. He, you know, He doesn't invite us for us to feel comfortable. He doesn't invite us, you know, so that we can be entertained. He come, you know, He invites us so that we will be comforted and challenged. So that we will be changed so that as a change agent, we can impact the world for Christ. America, you know, for the last, you know, two months or so, experiencing panic. You and I have seen it on TV. Perhaps we even experienced this, especially the last April and May. 
people are panicking. Not just the lost, but sadly, even the believers in the Lord. Why? Why were they panicking? Because they have built their houses. They have built their lives on sand that are sinking, not on the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. Uh, committing idolatry by glorifying you know, people in our lives, ambitions, pleasure, you know, fame, money, resources, and there are those who are you know, glorifying uh, the programs of their church, you know, the successes of their church, or even how great and um, influential or uh, eloquent their pastors. Guess what? God is horrified by that because He doesn't want us to idolize things, famous people, even politicians, celebrities, athletes, churches, church leaders, or anything that would occupy our hearts. He is a jealous God. And this is, you know, the word of the Lord. Our idols must come down. We must repent. I have seen and witnessed, you know, pastors, not just on TV, uh, even in my encounter with them, who have drunk on, you know, the wine of their self, you know, inflicted narratives, who drank on the successes of their lives and of their churches as if they are the reason why, you know, they have and experience some kind of successes. But God reminds us that no flesh can glory in the presence of God. All flesh is flesh. So the walls we put up that keep us from seeing the face of God, the walls that we built that keep us from repenting, God will pull down all these idols. And that's perhaps the reason why you know, allow this pandemic for us to realize that there are those things that we have placed before our lives, put up the walls that separate us between God. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded that you may pray. Notice the word sober. Uh, let me just... Um, uh, I forgot about uh, using my... Uh, there you go, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. And I want you to notice the word sober here. Uh, basically mean uh, from the Greek word to our English translation, that word sober means to be calm, to be cool and collected, to have that good sense, good judgment, to have that you know, sense of good wisdom and level-headed in times of distress, in times of when we are anxious, in times when we are shaken. And so that is what we have been told to do and we have been born again to experience and to pursue the spirit of god is saying to each and every believer in the lord to be sober to be calm to be of good sense to have a good grip of wisdom for us to be level-handed don't trust you know in anything or any human you know or, or any people or person in our lives that we should only, you know, uh, the Spirit of God basically is saying to us to be sober, to seek God's face and love Him passionately, return to our first love. That's what Revelation chapter 2, verse 4 uh, said, you know, when John was, uh, went up to heaven uh, in paradise and experienced and, and, and shown things that uh, he cannot uh, fully express, but the Lord asked him to write, and to the seven churches, and one of them to the church of Laodicea, I believe. And this is what he said. God says, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Have we left our first love? What are those loves that we have that replace the Lord Jesus Christ? Our country has an epidemic of backslidden churches, pastored by backslidden pastors, as I said, who have drunk the wine of their own, you know, self-inspired narratives. When I said self-inspired narratives, uh, S-I-N, sin, 
they talk about more of themselves, more of uh, the things that they accomplish, more of, you know, uh, stories rather than the inspired word of God. They, re, you know, they were obsessed with their successes and numbers, would refuse to preach repentance or, or preach, you know, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know how you can tell it? You know how can you and I, you know, um, find out if that is the case? You and I should ask this question. When was the last time that you and I hear our pastors or our leaders preach in their pulpits about the cross of Christ, about sin, about living a holy life. We need to tremble before God and we need to repent of all the sins that we have done. And in so doing, God will be pleased. You know, when I joined this church uh, in the 80s, when I came here, we had something what we called, you know, prayer vigil, prayer vigil or praying through. But you know, people don't do that anymore. Uh, sadly, there are churches who have removed their prayer meetings. They just pray in their, you know, own closets, families. And there's, you know, nothing wrong with that. But God called us as a body to pray together and to seek His face. face. Um, you know, God has told us, you know, for us to pray, to fall on our knees, to wait until there's a breakthrough. In other words, you know, we wait upon Him to show His glory until there's a, you know, a real revelation until we hear Him. And that's the time when we move. I experienced that in this church. And by the grace of God, the Lord has blessed this church. Many people came to know the Lord through the proclamation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in this church. Many who have grown in their faith and in service of the Lord through the faithful you know, uh, dissection and exposition of His Word from this pulpit in its Bible studies and ministries. There are churches that were planted as a result of you know, uh, the faithful teaching of His Word from this pulpit. And there are those you know, young people and adults who serve the Lord in a leadership capacity. And some are pastors, missionaries, because they heed the Word of God from this pulpit. There are those missionaries that we have supported, pioneering in their work, missionaries who are engaged in evangelism and discipleship, Christian organizations that proclaim the gospel or help you know, the needy and the lost. Why? The Lord has blessed this church with our missionary program. There was a time that we have about 96 missionary organizations that we support. Currently, we have 70, almost 70 missionaries and organizations that we still support. And there are those who came from this church who are pastors in our daughter churches. We need to hear from the Lord and need to act until the breakthrough happens. And that can only, you know, uh, when our burden is lifted up and the glory of the Lord falls when we engage in prayer. Yes, in closing, let me say this. God has allowed, you know, this coronavirus to call our distracted attention to remove us, you know, uh, and cast, to remove and cast down our idols. And so that we you and I will repent of our individual, corporate, and national sin. For us to stop running, you know, away from God and to be quiet before Him. God, uh, in Re Revelation uh, chapter 2, verse 4, so I said, you know, uh, God has this something against us because we have lost, you know, the true love of our life. Uh, I mentioned America is an epidemic or epidemic of backslidden churches led by backslidden pastors and leaders. Cry Christians are not praying in God's house as they used to. They walk inside their church and pray a quick prayer. In fact, there is not a red hot prayer going in there because, you know, the Holy Spirit's presence and power is absent. So how do I kind of, you know, put this all together? God has allowed, as I said, this coronavirus to get our distracted attention, to remove 
and cast down the idols that we have in this life, to repent of our sins as a church and as a nation, to stop running away from God and be quiet, you know, in, uh, in, in intimate communion with Him and meditation. You know what God did also? He shut down, you know, our business and our businesses because our self-interest has been on the throne of our lives and personal pleasure and entertainment has been the norm. You know, before the pandemic, you know, we enjoy the economic prosperity of our nation. We uh, bask in the many entertainments that we see and watch and attend. We glory in the many things that we go to, places that we visit, shopping, entertainment. We, you know, enjoy the prosperity of this nation and the careers that we have, that we have acquired so many things in our homes that are not really essential. We have, you know, uh, in our churches, uh, ignore the warning of God. And so God has removed all of those things. And those personal pleasure has been the norm. Uh, as a reminder, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, talks about, you know, there are those people who are building their lives in the sand and those who are building their lives upon a rock. And when, you know, the storm, you know, comes and blow before those two types of building, one would know which one will be destroyed and which one will stand, you know, the storm. And, you know, you can read that. So the house of God, through this pandemic, and I hope and pray that we learn, you know, the lessons uh, that we need to remove those idols that are competing with God, that we have placed on the thrones of our lives. We need to ask God for, you know, sincere repentance and heartfelt prayer, and that He wants us to have a spirit-empowered prayer life, a passion for the Word, and a passion for the loss. And that building that God is putting together begins, as I said, by removing the idols in our lives, by having a heartfelt repentance, and for us to return to the house of the Lord with the Spirit-empowered prayer lives. And I believe that is the reason why God allowed this pandemic. And there are perhaps other biblical, scriptural reasons, but those are the three things that we need to seriously consider. So, beloved in the Lord, dear ones, I hope and pray that the Word of God, this message has ministered to you, that these principles of God's Word challenge you to reevaluate the priorities, the passions of your lives and put Christ in His proper place, that He should be the one on the throne of our hearts that he should be the one providing, you know, direction and guidance in our journey of faith. Just like Kuya Bert, or Pastor Bert, as I would fondly call him, Kuya Bert. You know, he accepted Christ through faith. And he was entrusted by God. It's a contract between Christ and him. He kept the faith in good times and bad times. He was a good steward of that faith. He lived that faith. He fought for that faith. And thus, on May 30, when God called him home, he received the reward of that faithfulness in the Lord. God called us to be faithful. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today that we given the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we enjoy... Um, how you grant us insight uh, by way of the Holy Spirit and how you have given us uh, the knowledge and the understanding uh, to be able to grasp uh, within our minds, our hearts, and our spirit how beautiful and wonderful your word is. And by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we know that we'll be given the opportunity and it's really a privilege on our part uh, to apply it so that, you know, um, the truth of what Peter said um, in the book of the Bible, that we will grow in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, it is your goal when you called us unto salvation.
for us throughout our lives until you call us home, that we will grow in the study and meditation of your word, that we will grow in our understanding of your word and the principles and the truth and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, we will apply them and would experience what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is all about and thus change us into um, the image or be conformed to the likeness of your Son. And until you call us home, help us, Father, to remain faithful in investing our lives, to be a diligent student of your word, to be an effective doer of your word, so that when our life is over, we would surely hear your commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. And Pastor Bert, your Bert heard that on May 30 when you called him home. Remind us that our life is short and brief. And what really counts is not what we profess or confess, but the things that we do for your honor and your glory. For this, Father, we ask and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to remind our members, uh, Faith Bible Church of San Francisco and of Tri-City, uh, we have a viewing uh, of the remains of Pastor Bert at Faith Bible Church of Oakland in Alameda. Uh, the address is uh, 1206 Lincoln Avenue, Alameda City. And... Um, at the end of that day, uh, today, around 5 to about 5.30, we will have a short service, a short meditation. And i like to invite uh, each one of you uh, to make it. Uh, it is only once that, you know, we can pay respect uh, to a life we'll live and to be of comfort and encouragement to Ate Cynthia. Uh, please, uh, if you have the strength and the time, since, you know, you and I can pretty much do anything we want, we can visit and go places anytime we want, make it a point to be of encouragement to Atacentia, the Kawilan family, and the Pagmanwa family. If God has given you that protection all through about, you know, two and a half to three months from this pandemic, God will also give you that same protection, you know, to give respect and to show your love. To Ate Cynthia. May the Lord bless you, and I pray that uh, He would continue uh, to provide uh, what we need so that we can overcome uh, this situation uh, that we're going through. I'm glad that there is an easing of restriction, and uh, the city of San Francisco has allowed us uh, to open our church with a limited uh, number of people based on the capacity of the church. Um, I hope to see, you know, uh, most of you uh, this coming Sunday. Um, also, Tri-City, we might have a joint service because I'm also the speaker there. So I'm still praying uh, what location I should, you know, uh, have the service, either here in San Francisco or at Tri-City. Either way, I would let you know uh, early this week so that you would be prepared uh, to worship with us. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you safe.